we have two more sessions for today, and then we're going to try to index at 1700. I think um, a lot of folks are interested in this next panel. I know that a lot of attendees here are dual use investors, and um, over the past year, year and a half, dual use has been actually one of the hottest sectors within venture, I would say, and that has definitely not been the case over the past 10 years. And I know a number of military veteran VCs that are in this room are actually defense tech dual use. And um, this is an impressive panel we have here in terms of backgrounds. And I won't be moderating it, but I would ask that Raj, who, I, who I've known for a few years, to start off in terms of introducing himself, and then we'll go down the line, and then Connie will start with her Q&A. Thank you all. Thanks, Tim. Working. Great. Uh, and thanks for putting this conference together. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rod Shaw. Uh, I've uh, been in and out of the national security and, uh, and uh, Silicon Valley world my, my whole career. Uh, I now uh, run a fund called Shield Capital, and we invest in companies at the intersection of national security and, and commercial. Can you hear? There we go. Is that better? All right. Um, but yeah, I, I uh, started my career in the Air Force. Uh, I wanted to serve. I liked airplanes. The Air Force told me I could do both. So I said, great, sign me up. Uh, like Paul, if he's still here, qualified on the uh, F-16, later models than his, uh, and uh, spent five years on active duty, and then I've been in the reserves the last uh, uh, 15. And uh, in between that, I got to start a few companies here in the Valley, and I had the honor of uh, getting to help set up and run something called the Defense Innovation Unit. So great to be here with everyone. I'm Trey. Uh, I started my career in the intelligence community, and then I ran sales at a co software company called Palantir for six years, uh, joined Founders Fund, which is a multi-stage venture capital firm started by the PayPal Mafia back in 2014. And then in 2017, I started Anderol Industries, which is a defense technology company um, uh, that uh, I'm spending the majority of my time on these days, but still, still investing as well. Awesome. So Bilal Zuberi here. Um, I feel like I'm surrounded by military and intel mafia, and I have nothing to do with that. Uh, besides invest in it, I actually came to this country as an immigrant, so I uh, didn't have a chance to serve. Um, but I've been in the startup world for 20 years. I built my own company and sold that, and then for 15 years I've been investing. I'm a partner at Lux Capital, and we invest uh, both early and late, but in deep tech companies, and a lot of those companies tend to have either military applications uh, and dual use, or in some cases like, like Anduril, very focused on military itself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Bauscher. I'm the president of Incutel. Uh, I've served uh, at Incutel for the last 16 years. Uh, before that, I was a general partner for eight years at InterWest Partners. Um, if you're not familiar with Incutel, we're an independent uh, 501c3 not-for-profit that gets money from the CIA, EIA, NSA, and several other U.S. intelligence agencies to invest in startups with technologies of interest to them. And then we facilitate the piloting and adoption of those technologies by those agencies. Great to be here, really excited about the conversation. Uh, and uh, I'm Connie Loises. I am uh, the founder of a, a newsletter and media series called Strictly VC, and I'm also the Silicon Valley editor of TechCrunch, and I'm also the daughter of a uh, veteran and the niece of veterans, so I'm really pleased to be here. Um, guys, and I've actually never met these guys, so I really it's great to <laughs> see all of you in person. Um, you know, one thing I just wanted to ask, you know, it's 2023. It seemed to me, you know, that were, I don't know, maybe it was back in 2018, Google was getting a lot of heat for, uh, you know, potentially developing or helping de to develop weapons. Uh, there, was, uh, there was just sort of this sentiment in Silicon Valley that, you know, startups weren't really supposed to be um, fostering ties with the government. And I just wonder if that has changed dramatically. Uh, Steve, would you want to start? Sure. So, so I have a sort of a contrarian uh, uh, answer uh, to this question. I know Trey, uh, uh, in particular, disagrees with me here. So, uh, uh, we'll, we'll get we'll get it going uh, uh, quickly here. Um, so, for the last 16 years, we've met with a thousand companies a year as a firm, uh, uh, representing CIA, which is perhaps even uh, uh, less sympathetic a customer than the DoD is <laughs> uh, 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 to startup companies. In in those years uh, that we meet with a thousand companies a year maybe five to 10 actually ever turn us down and say they're not interested in working uh, with the customers that we represent. Uh, I think the 
uh, reluctance of Silicon Valley to work with the DoD and the Intel community is is overblown. I think the Google incident that uh, or the issue that you refer to with uh, Project Maven is unique to sort of the culture and management style of Google. Uh, uh, and I think they would all admit in retrospect they did a lot of things wrong uh, with regard to that. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that the vast majority of Silicon Valley is very eager to work with the government because one, they're patriotic, they want to help with the mission of the agencies we work with, two, they're uh, engineers, and engineers get geeked out by working on the hardest problems, and oftentimes the government represents the hardest problems, and three, they're capitalists by nature, and they want to make money, and the government spends a lot of money on, on tech. So uh, uh, I, I think the uh, reluctance is a little bit overblown. That being said, I think in the last five years, there's been a lot more interest in it and a lot more awareness of the attractiveness of it based on the early success of two companies, Palantir, that Trey was intimately uh, involved with in uh, uh, um, uh, SpaceX. Uh, uh, and like anything else, as Paul said in the previous uh, 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 panel, you know, we're, there's a little bit of group think here in Silicon Valley, but probably a little bit too much. And when you see successful companies in uh, uh, an unusual or distinctive or, or first to market manner, people want to replicate it. And so when those two companies demonstrated the success of serving this market, I think other com companies and other entrepreneurs want to start companies to serve this market and the other venture capitalists want to make the returns that those early investors made in those two companies as well. Great, well Trey, I don't know if you want to add anything. I, I was also just relatedly curious if the war in Ukraine had changed sentiment. You know, I mean, obviously there's wars everywhere, but that was very much in the headlines. and. I actually don't really disagree with you, Steve. Uh, I, I agree that uh, it was somewhat overblown. Uh, there were only 5,000 people that signed the letter. Uh, Google has like over 100,000 employees. Uh, there also wasn't any differentiation between U.S. nationals that signed the letter and non-U.S. nationals. So uh, it's, it's not clear that that was really like the issue that people made it out to be. Um, also, for what it's worth, this is one of the beauties of living in a democracy. Um, in China, in Russia, uh, in Iran, um, and other places like that, uh, you don't have an option to about whether or not you're going to support the military. There's a civil military fusion. Anything you do in an area of strategic technology, uh, str any strategic technology initiative can be co-opted into a national defense strategy. We don't do that in the United States. I think that's great. Um, Google is an advertising company. They, uh, they pretend that they're not with Google X and self-driving cars and everything else that they make no revenue from. It's an advertising company. Um, if you take a job there, you, you're signing up to uh, build ads. Um, and that's fine. That's a choice that people are allowed to make in America, and I love that. Uh, they don't have to work on national security priorities. And uh, we just need more companies that do want to work on national security priorities. I'll jump in. So uh, I was involved with Project Maven on the government side and got to go to the many of the meetings. And you'd walk into the room and you'd instantly know who the government folks are, right? Because they're all they're having very close haircuts and, you know, tucked in shirts. Uh, but all of the engineers that were working on it were virtually all immigrants, either Indian or Chinese. And they were super excited about what they were doing. The protesters were folks that had nothing to do with it, and I would say a little bit on the entitled side, and didn't understand what uh, the importance of living in a democracy is. So, but, but since then, I think there's been a sea change. I mean, the number of companies, founders, entrepreneurs, interested in national security broadly, you know, I've never seen it at, at this level. Uh, and so that's, that's amazingly, uh, amazingly exciting. And I think a lot of it is, you know, the mission. Um, the you know, photo sharing apps are only so interesting, right? Like you know, you, you, people don't go home and have a real sense of being. And I think the problem sets that are in national security matter, they're interesting. And post Ukraine, people realize, well, hey, we can't take democracy for granted. It's something worth defending. And so I've seen even in the last 10 months, quite a change. So I'll take a different tack on it, which is, um, you know, I've been, looking at this space for 20 years or so, and we always invest only in the intersection of deep technology and sciences, which tends to be either military funded, you know, SBIR programs and this and that and whatever, or they tend to have early customers, you know, InQtel has been a partner for maybe two dozen companies or five dozen companies actually in my history. Um, what has changed is the investor appetite. I don't think the founders have changed. I don't think the founders have woken up one day and said, hey, go America. Right? Uh, that, that hasn't happened, whether they're immigrant or not immigrant. They're working on interesting technologies. Military is a customer. 
Um, I think you can take the most hardcore patriotic rah 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 nationalist person. They also want to do good, and they don't want their technology to be used for the wrong purposes, even by the U.S. military. Um, you know, so the uh, what has changed is, I think, as Steve was saying, the you know the success of companies like Palantir and SpaceX and others have not only shown that they can you can build very large companies, which means VCs took notice. Ah, I can create multiples of my fund, not just a nice company that returns five x back to my fund. Um, but also a little bit of a roadwork has been done on what it takes to build these kinds of companies. Like that was unclear. Frankly, for five years or so at least, I spent many I sent many companies to Trey, and Trey passed on every single one of them, <laughs> right? And and Trey would be like, these companies are never going to make it. And frankly, none of them made it, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and 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 so, but but you know, through that conversation, and I remember sitting in his office, and he went to the board, and he's like, "There's this triangle, and you know, you have the technology, and it can't be thrown over the wall to the business guys, and the business guys needs to be involved, and then you need the right kind of capital so that you're not asking government to pay for product development, and and some of that ended up in in how uh, Andrel works. Now, most people did not have that formula or that 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 roadmap, so a lot of the founders would come in with interesting ideas. Here's this thing I spun out of MIT, or here's the thing that I'm building." You know, I was an early investor in the drone world. Like, this is like 11, 12 years ago, I was investing in a consumer slash military drone. But nobody would pay attention to it because there was no way of making money. No investor was looking at it. And then every investor invested in it. Unfortunately, most of them actually lost all their money in it. But the, the reality is that that, that road, road map has become very important. Now, why this is also important is not only for everybody who wants to build a company in defense tech space to sort of pay attention to that a little bit. So you're not making the mistakes of founders 10 years ago, but doing the way it's being done now and seeing more success. But also, remember, we haven't had a big outcome yet since Palantir, right? Like Andural is a big company and there's a few others, you know, Shield AI and Primer and SailDrone and a whole bunch of others, but they're not exited IPO companies yet. These companies need to be successful. Otherwise, the VCs will walk away again, right? Like, and I think this is an important thing to note that, you know, as, as you hear, all of us, we, we're here together, but we're also in front of defense panels and, you know, all kinds of uh, generals and admirals. And, and our case to them always is that don't take it for granted that the billions of dollars that have been invested in defense tech in, over the last few years will continue to be available going forward. If these companies, this generation's companies are not successful, it will once again become a space that, you know, too hard for VCs to do. Super interesting feedback. Um, you know, one thing that I wondered, um, again, not really knowing the space as well as I'd like to, um, is maybe what percentage of companies are pitching you that have the government in mind as a primary customer versus are commercial co customers who, you know, maybe even haven't thought about military applications or, you know, are coming at the military as sort of like a secondary um, endpoint. Um, Raj? Sure, I'll, uh, I'll start with, uh, with that. Um, you know, and, and I think there was, you know, in the topic of this panel is uh, dual use and there's a lot of that discussed. You know, from my view, dual use is not a strategy. Like, it's an, it's an outcome. So, uh, each company, I think, is a little bit different, and it depends on what uh, technology category they're trying to build. So, for example, if it's a cybersecurity business, there are ample customers and CIOs uh, in the world. And if, if it's a defensive cyber business and you can't get a CIO of a large company to, to build your product, it's probably not that good, and I wouldn't go and start with government first, right? That's, we'll, we'll go to government later. But if you're building an autonomous vehicle that isn't going to be able to fly because of FAA regulations, then the government's a, a great customer. So I think it di each one, each company has a different pathway, and you have to have the strategy of which customers to go first uh, uh, match what they are. You know, and, and our thesis uh, at Shield, of course, is we want companies that will eventually uh, have some interplay with both. I, I would add one other thing, which is a lot of founders we meet have not spent time with military. They have not, they're not veterans. They have not worked with the military. Uh, they don't know the lingo. They don't know the sales processes or any such thing. So some of the you know, dual use aspects also come from they understand that military would, could be a great customer, but they don't know how to really approach that. And if you don't really know that, um, you, you start somewhere else 
or at least start to work on something else as well that you're more comfortable with, um, and then start you know putting your foot in the door and seeing if you're getting some traction. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot is that if you're building something, let's say an enterprise software business, cybersecurity or anything else, and you're in Silicon Valley, you can hire amazing talent. You could be straight out of school, never having had a job, even cleaning the yard, right? You've never had a job, you start a company, you can hire amazing talent to surround yourself with expertise. You can hire an amazing VP of engineering who can build out an engineering team and how to recruit. You can hire a sales team who will be like, this is how the sales processes work, top-down sales, bottom-up sales, you know, enterprise accounts and SDRs, BDRs. You don't need to know any of this because your head of sales will figure some of this out for you. Right? Um, you can hire amazing marketing people. Now, try doing the same thing for a defense tech company. Where is that, what is that person? Like literally we have founders who have raised a lot of money who come and have conversations. So I'm starting to think of getting some traction from the defense. What's, what, should I bring on a, a four-star general on the board? Is that the right starting place? Or is that a, should I set up a salesperson or a business development person? Should I hire a lobbying firm? Where do you start? Now, you, if you don't have a lot of money, you can't hire 10 people to have a full office in DC and be doing this. So, and there's not, one simple solution to this. There's not a lot of people you can send them to. There's not a lot of Trey's and Raj's out there that will just be like, oh yeah, let me come help you and figure this out if you're not in their portfolio. So that is another one of those reasons why you don't see a lot of founders who otherwise might actually look at military first as a customer base and not looking at it because they have no way, way to even start and they can't take that risk with their investor's capital to go in. Yeah, I think it's a good point. There's a there's a smaller uh, set of companies that are government first, right? That are they've started their company and their DNA is we're going to sell into the U.S. government, particularly probably DoD. And we're going to solve very specific problems for them, and they're going to figure out how to be successful by hook or by crook, or they're going to fail and and, and 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 go out of business. But there's a larger set of companies that are building great generalizable uh, uh, technology for customers, and it could be applied to commercial customers just as easily as it could be applied to government customers. And those companies traditionally resisted the government market in the early stages because the perception was the government market's really hard to penetrate, uh, uh, and that the primes have this inherent advantage because they understand how to you respond to RFIs and RFPs and get on the GSA schedule and get FedRAMP certified and all these other things that really have nothing to do with the quality of your technology or product, but have everything to do with how you're successful or not successful uh, selling to the government. But there are companies like FireEye and Cloudera and MongoDB that have you know invested in that uh, 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 a skill set and that knowledge, and built significant uh, public sector verticals, vertical markets uh, within their uh, uh, companies, and have allowed them to help be even more successful than they otherwise would have. And as long as the U.S. government continues to move in this slow, inexorable way towards being a better customer of, of these companies, that's good for the end use users at the DoD and, and telecommunity, because then they're getting the best uh, uh, technology built in our country for the, for the problem that they're trying to solve, as opposed to the best technology built by a small set of companies that know how to sell to the U.S. government. So if most of the companies start on the you know, commercial side and eventually you know, work toward the government, I'm wondering um, if mission creep is ever a, a, an issue, meaning you start to sell to the government and then you know, everything you've got to do for the government is so sort of customized. Um, and then they, you know, the specs keep changing. I just wonder, you know, and you're spending more and more of your time kind of catering to the government. Is that something that you see very often? Trey? Yeah, um, I think this is exactly what makes it hard to do both at an early stage. Um, because a lot of the, the programs that you can do early business with the Department of Defense on uh, do require some like DODization of uh, your product for that use case. Um, and so I think a lot of times what happens is, you know, companies will go and get like SBIRs or Inkytel work programs, which are great, by the way, like Palantir and Anduril wouldn't exist if it weren't for Inkytel work programs. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, and, uh, and they end up like building all of this like very DOD specific workflow stuff that's taking them away from the commercial business that they need to make it work, make the business work. And so a lot of times like, uh, you know, the most successful companies at doing dual use are the ones that start commercial, and then later, once they have product market fit on the commercial side, they'll spin up a federal business to, like, make the federal business work. Um, the Android side of this, and the reason why we, we started Android to do what Android does, is we said, we're not going to do commercial. 
Like, we're just going to tell everyone that from the very beginning. This is a defense company. <laughs> we're only going to sell to the defense market. Um, now, that's incredibly hard to pull off. Um, in fact, if you look at the, the most successful companies in this space, like um, SpaceX, Palantir, um, Anderil, you have C3AI, has some big com contracts. They're all founded by billionaires. You need like a massive capital advantage to, to make that sort of business work because it takes so long to get into production with the DoD that you have to be able to raise like a basically infinite amount of seed dollars, otherwise your company is gonna die. And so I'm always a little bit hesitant with companies that are like, I'm gonna be, do defense business, I'm gonna raise a $3 million seed round. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> You're not, you're not gonna make this work. You gotta figure out how to do the commercial thing or figure out how to raise $20 million on an idea. And there's not really a whole lot of in between there in my mind. Uh, you know, sort of relatedly, I wonder um, how a company or, and the government deals with IP rights. So you've got, your, you've got this you know, great commercial application, then you start working with the government um, and then maybe they start to, I don't know, you know there's like some, proprietary thing happening where you know they don't want that information or that you know your work with them to sort of fall into the hands of um, adversaries um, how does that whole thing work how do you sort of and does that get neg negotiated like right at the outset or is that an ongoing process uh, which, which one of us wants to yeah. give a really technical answer to Government purpose rights. Without using <laughs> Not term, me. <laughs> without using the term far. <laughs> this is really complicated. Uh, yeah, there's government purpose rights on on things that are developed are negotiable. I think is like the the fun the foundational aspect here, and you have to like know what you're negotiating for to make sure you're not negotiating all of your IP away to the government as part of a deal, and that's just like you have to have reps and knowing how to do it. I, mean, I guess what I, what I would say is that this is a broader issue. So there's IP rights, there's exclusivity, there's so many different things that are just unique to the government that you really need to have a guide, right? You, you know, and, the, and the government is not just one customer, right? The DOD is a 800 or 1,000 different customers with their own budgets, their own needs, their own processes. And so navigating uh, that process is, is a tough one particularly for a young startup, because you only have so much time. You're time limited more than anything else, right? Not really money limited uh, either in this in climate. And so surrounding yourself with the, the right team of advisors and investors so you can make those judicious decisions, you know, IP rights being one, you go to Incutel or you go to DIU, it's just like you're working with any commercial company. You go to maybe somebody else and now you're, you know, you're burned through 100 grand of lawyer uh, time, which is not a good use. So. I think you know building the right purpose team for the market you're going after is so critical in this space that's that's pretty opaque. Most dual use companies have full fledged federal groups, meaning it's not the same sales guy who's calling on Salesforce is also calling on Pentagon and some task force within some branch of the service. So you have to either be all in or not. So it's the, a lot of companies, and I remember 10 years ago, the companies that I would send to Trey, they were like sort of, you know, they would hire one guy, and he's like floating around wherever he is, probably lives in Kansas and spends some time in DC and shows up at board meetings, and he's like the defense guy. Some colonel they've hired who's gonna be sales guy because he bought a lot of product when he was inside the service. That doesn't work. You have to really understand what the, all the processes are you know, what kind of, even early days, you know, there are SBIRs, there's SCTDRs, there's all kinds of contracts, OTAs, there's others, they all have different IP requirements. They have, you know, so negotiating them, avoiding some of them that you don't want, um, having the right kind of capital so you're selling product rather than doing, you know, deals where IP does become jointly owned. Um, at the end of the day, the government can come calling for anything. In the name of national security, they can frankly take anything they want. But uh, more important is that um, you know, you're not stuck in a situation, frankly, from the dual use side, where a commercial entity has a problem. I have a company that got an NSF grant. You know, now this is a unicorn. It was an early stage company. Two guys started it in my office. The first thing they did was wrote an NSF grant, got a $100,000 NSF grant. 
then they raised venture capital from me. We didn't even think about NSF grant, whatever. You know, thought of it. I thought of it as you know, nice to have on the resume type thing. Um, and then they started to do a Series B raise, and the Series B raise was a larger firm that does diligence on what other contracts you have. And there was a clause in NSF that said, hey, if the government needs it for some purposes, and it had nothing to do with defense, if government needs it, we can use it. We had to literally wait six months while we negotiated with the NSF and some you know, dipshit at NSF who didn't care about this at all, negotiated with NSF to be able to get that right back. Like we, I was willing to pay $200,000 to that NSF, just take the money and go away. But they're like, no, we always do this, we can't go back, and the grant was given a year and a half ago. So you can run into problems unintended and you know, unplanned for when you're dealing with the government. And that's why I think you need to have the right team members, the right advisors, the right investors, and even then, you know, who knows. Steve, you're being very quiet. Uh, I think they all made, made good points. You know, I think the, m m the most generalizable takeaway out of this is the more you can productize what you're selling to the government, the less you have to get involved in all this. And, and, and the more you're doing sort of joint development work or getting grants or, or some other thing that implies you're creating IP as part of your contract with the government, the more you're going to get sucked into this. So uh, uh, it, in some ways, it's good discipline to try and focus you to be product from day one. Because uh, 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 if you can be product from day one, it will really help you in, in this area and in other areas. I'm sure this is not like a, the top problem for a lot of people in the audience, but what happens when you sell to the US government and then you want to sell to other governments? Because it's going so well. How, do, how does that work? Yeah, um, I think this is like one of the things that certainly I didn't understand when I was at Palantir for a long time, um, but has become more clear. Um, there's actually not that many foreign governments that buy direct defense articles from the United, from United States companies. Um, there's a handful, like you can sell direct to the UK, you can sell direct to Australia, um, you can sell, you know, non ITAR controlled stuff uh, to like the United Arab Emirates. Like there are countries, there are some countries that have money. Most countries don't have money. Um, and the money that they do have to spend on de defense articles comes through the foreign military sales, foreign military financing process. And so really you're selling to the United States State Department uh, via the Department of Defense, and they're doing a transfer of the technology. Um, so, you know, I, I think the mistake that I see a lot of startups make in this space is they're like, you know, I've got this thing that I sell to the DOD, and now I'm just like gonna fly all over the world and try to meet with military officials from around the world. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll hear like the craziest stories. They'll come in and I'll be like, I met with the Deputy Director of the Ministry of Defense of Ecuador, and they are totally gonna buy this. I'm like, with whose money? is Ecuador going to buy your $2 million thing? They're not gonna buy with their money, so who is the actual customer here? Um, and I think this is something that like, when you have some level of maturity, you start figuring out, like, the US government is your primary customer. <laughs> the Five Eyes is a somewhat secondary customer. Everything after that is the US government basically selling your thing for you. Um, and I, I haven't seen a whole lot of exceptions to that. Um, you know, another thing that I was wondering about is when you're, you know, you're doing commercial um, sales and you're also selling to the government, and you're, you know, so in the case of AI, your AI is getting better because you are um, processing government that you're getting from the, I'm sorry, you're processing data that you're getting from the government. Um, like, what sort of lines are, can, can you and can you not cross in terms of um, using what you've learned in the, that for, you know, on the, and catering to the military and your commercial applications? Like how do you sort of like tease those apart? Is that, can that be a problem for startups? Especially again on the AI front. That sounds like a Steve question. So um, the, there are certain aspects of the intelligence community and certain aspects of the DOD that will have classified data and they will not want you to uh, uh, take anything you learn from training your algorithm on that data uh, uh, and repurpose it back into a commercial uh, uh, a product. Uh, uh, and, and so you have to think about that, again, as you structure your ar architecture and your roadmap and your, in, in, in your product thing. I think there are other areas of, of the government, though, where that won't be an issue. And in fact, probably the largest scale of the data that you might want to train your algorithm on is probably going to be unclassified. And, and, and so you can work on that. 
you can probably work around that if you're thoughtful about it, but it is, to your point, it's a good question. It, it's something that I think you have to be really thoughtful up front about because otherwise you get into an example like uh, Bilal's with the NSF where you have an unintended consequence of an early contract that you know, ultimately isn't that significant to the creation of your business but creates all sorts of issues uh, for you down the road. And then in terms of you guys all have, some of you, co you've co-invested, your friends, but you're also probably competing for some deals. Um, what about, um, how does the government sort of decide which startup which gets access to which sort of pieces of classified information? Like if it's, if it's, if it's working with one startup, is that, you know, does it work exclusively with that startup or will it kind of, you know, how does that whole thing work? And I'm sorry, because some of the founders here might already know the, the answer to that question, but I think that's sort of, for me, interesting. This is another Steve question. Uh, <laughs> this is why Inkytel exists. Right, so um, uh, I think what I would say there is the government, government has lots of rules and regulations around classification of data, classification of mission, classification of, of, of use cases. Um, uh, they uh, will, if, if they're doing some sort of classified procurement, there are different rules about what companies are allowed to submit and, and respond to a request for proposal and then bid for, for, for that uh, 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 business. I think it's actually s a smaller part of the world uh, uh, than, than you might think. And, and so if I was a startup company, I would encourage you to start by focusing on the unclassified uh, uh, aspects of these areas. And, and uh, you might get pulled into classified world down the road, but it's, uh, it's not necessarily where I'd start uh, uh, as my initial uh, customer, just because of some of the things you're, you're alluding to, which is it's, there's a lot higher bar for the evaluation of the company uh, in that uh, circumstance. I, I, would, I, would, I'm ju I was just sitting here thinking about all our portfolio companies that, that use geospatial you know, algorithms or um, you know, now some um, large language models and so on. Uh, where AI is going, two things are very clear. One is, you know, more data is better, and actually military doesn't have as much data as you would think they do, uh, or at least certainly not in a format that you can use it very much. So uh, for very specific applications, you know, there are literally companies that are getting founded now I know of that have been seeded to really ch take their data and convert it into a format that can be used by their own guys because it's very hard to use that data. But majority-wise, you know, all the Project Maven participants, you know, they're not using government data. They're using government data for inference, but all the training data is actually commercial data. We have a bunch of companies who participate in that. Um, a lot of companies that are using geospatial data, satellite data, they train their algorithms on commercial satellites, and then you may get additional information from satellites that may be looking at North Korea or something. But that's, again, on the inference side largely. Um, and and the, the second thing is that these models are right now pretty black box models. There's not a lot of technology developed and it's happening and again we're funding some of this stuff to open up these models for transparency and ethics and explainability. But these are very early stages of that. It's right now where you've been just people, are, th this is, there's a whole area of ML ops that's emerging and this is going to be a part of that to understand where the data came from, where it went. and the. Examples, again, will emerge from the commercial side first, right? So all of us have seen those computer-generated images, generative AI. You know, people will need to figure out whose, whose photography was utilized to train this model to then generate this outcome, and should they be getting any um, royalty for that? And how will we figure that out? Right now, frankly, we don't have the technology to do that. Like, you know, it's a, it's a cluster soup, right? And good things come out of it. But at some point, people will say, if you're using my data, you're going to pay for it. This is how we ended up in the walled gardens of Facebook and all of that because, you know, hey, they don't want your data to be used. They didn't want Facebook data to be used for training Twitter algorithms, and there was a wall created. Well, I wonder about that, you know, as investors because, you know, to your point, like the AI is only as good as what it's being trained on. So for some of these startups that say they can help the military assess you know, threats, if the data they're getting is not, you know, historically the data has not been that great, how does that work? Others will have interesting ideas. Look, there's, you know, uh, necessity is the mother of all invention, and that's what's happening here. So 
military us usually has limited amount of data, but in many other applications, you have very limited amount of data. So you start generating algorithms that are trained on less data. So single shot training, and it, there's a lot of stuff that is really models developed specifically for low um, in low data inputs. Then there is you know this entire field of synthetic data creation, which is you know going to be applicable for you know, human clinical trials, but also for, you know, we only have that many images of stealth Chinese ships parked in Chinese ports, right? So can we create imagery that looks like that, that creates variations of that? Can we do simulated exercises to, to train our models? Uh, the same thing is having, happening in automotive. You know, you were the first uh, Google being early in that field ran millions and millions of miles, and all of us saw these cars driving around Silicon Valley. But not every automotive company is able to do that. So they're actually taking less data, but then creating millions of variations of that using simulation uh, exercises to be able to train the models and train, train it for better. So I think new technology is being developed every day to sort of address those problems so that we're not limited only by having you know, limited data. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll jump in here. I think you know, things have changed, and folks in the Nescu universe have, have realized, look, the, the, the DOD doesn't have an exclusive uh, ownership or access to all the data that's important in war fighting. I think that's what Ukraine has done, is visibly shown that. So if you think about uh, the overhead imagery of an intel collection, right, uh, it was not all just exquisite, uh, expensive satellites. You had companies like Capella doing star work. You had companies like Hawkeye doing RF work and publicly showing uh, what that capability of finding new data is. Even if you look at uh, command and control, right, it wasn't using military radios, it was signal over iPhones over Starlink, right? And all three of those uh, commercial type of, uh, of technologies. And so I think when we think about data, the technology, and its applicability to deter conflict, you know, things are rapidly changing, and this is the Ukraine conflict, in my opinion, it's just the, the first visible salvo in this, and will extend it as we think about Taiwan and other, other potential areas. So, that's a great point, Raj, and, and, and just to build on it, I think one of the really interesting uh, unanticipated consequences of the increased use of commercial technology and commercial data in, in the Ukraine conflict is that it's easier for the U.S. government to share data collected by commercial uh, uh, sensors with their uh, allies and counterparts than uh, data collected by exquisite or classified uh, 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 means. And, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's a lot easier for the U.S. government to share Capello or Hawkeye uh, 360 uh, 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 data. And I'm not sure if we didn't have the commercial space uh, 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 platforms that we have today, whether the U.S. government would be able to share as much data with the U Ukraine in this conflict. Um, I also just think about, um, I mean, what you're funding is so consequential in wonderful ways, but also, you know, potentially dangerous ways. Uh, AI is, you know, I interviewed Sam Altman recently, and he was talking about, you know, the great abundance that AI can um, usher in, but also he's scared. He he's, has said, for example, uh, in a separate interview I did with him a couple of years ago, that he's nervous about autonomous weapons um, and, uh, you know, uh, cybersecurity, you know, things can go wrong there. Um, one thing I wanted to ask, Raj, if you don't mind. So I, just before I came over here, I saw a, a Vox story about one of your portfolio companies that was not very flattering. Um, but, you know, I mean, so um, I don't know if you want to address that or not, but um, either way, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, sometimes people oversell what they are capable of doing. There's only so much that you as VCs, you know, only so much insight into each of your companies that you have. When you're dealing with uh, you know these government applications. How do you how do you think about that? How do you sort of like verify that the founders that are telling you, um, or what they're telling you is you know accurate? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. You think about, uh, you know, and I think it's a it's a broad um, uh, question for all venture investing, right? So if you meet a you meet a founder, you're doing your diligence. How do you know they're really doing what they say they're doing? Do you uh, do you believe in the team and their ability to uh, operate uh, ethically. And you know, I think that's the other part that makes uh, investing in uh, national security more challenging and why you know, the, three, or the three of us or four of us have been on many panels together is that 
you have to have really unique and deep relationships in, amongst that customer set to be able to make those calls and inquiries and, and find out. And those relationships in the national security world take a long time to build up. And I think that's, again, uh, why a specialist sort of view and approach is required to you know, understand you know, what's really happening and you're not you know, buying into hype. I would add one other thing, which is, um, so one part of diligence is, does the technology do what it's capable of doing? And, and especially when you start talking about AI, you know, there's the high AI, right? Is it AGI and is it like self-deterministic and what will it, decisions will it make? But I think there's also, you know, how much do we really understand what the technology is able to do? And then you have nested models where the in outputs of one model is going into another model. You may not be discriminating, but you look at the data and you can decide just based on, you know, um, loan information out of a bank that, hey, it's continuously discriminating against people of a particular religion or a particular uh, race, not because somebody wrote the AI that way. Right? Many of us may have seen this video where there's a soap dispenser that wouldn't dispense soap and a black hand would go underneath it but would do it for white. I'm fairly sure that engineer didn't sit there and say, let me make a soap dispenser that does not you know, give soap to black people. Right? But somehow, somewhere, the sensor was not trained, the data that was given to that sensor was not trained to be able to fix that as a problem. And then of course it comes out and it's embarrassing and Obviously, shouldn't have happened. There should have been checks and balances along the way. So there's that. But the bigger issue is, you know, so when we first invested in, in Anduril, I mean, obviously, we knew Trey, and, and through Trey, at least I've been speaking for myself, I met Palmer and Brian and others. Um, there was two layers of uh, belief systems that we needed to have. One, their customer is going to be the government of the United States initially and mostly. Do we want to serve as a government of the United States? The government of the United States has sometimes done horrible things. But, you know, and mistakes have been made too, and sometimes they were not mistakes. But we believe that as citizens of the United States, it is important for us to protect our democracy and to be able to provide the best available technology in the hands of our fighters so that they're able to win the wars that obviously the Congress enables them to do. And, and you know, war is one part of that, but there's defensive technologies and so on and so forth. So we made that decision on moral grounds that that's the right thing to do. Some VCs could disagree with that. We chose that if we are unable to defend, you know, then we have a bigger problem. There are people who believe that somehow if China attacked us, there's like a secret building somewhere in DC and amazing weapons are stored inside and will, it, it doesn't work that way. There's no hidden technology out there that will protect us. Every threat that you hear about and read about, somebody out there is putting their lives at risk and trying their best that they can to protect all the rest of us. And it is incumbent upon us, my belief, that we provide technology to, for, to, for, for doing that. The second belief that we had to have was that these individuals who were starting a company, at that point they hadn't built product yet, and, and certainly if they had the first product idea, they didn't know what the 10th product was gonna look like, that these people are moral people, right? And, and, and then these people have their moral compasses set right. And, and I can tell you that one of the diligence items we had just talking to people was, you know, do they all believe in the same thing? And actually, it was important to us that they don't. They have push and pull, right? They're Democrats and they're non-Democrats, Republicans. There's people of various faiths, people who are very religious and people who are not religious. And that was our way of actually figuring out that, you know, that is how U.S. works. Like, we don't all agree in the same thing. We disagree. I, I am very left-leaning, and this is publicly now written in articles, right, that there was debates and discussions within Lux Capital that, you know, is this a right investment, good investment, or not? It wasn't like some, you know, ultra-right, ultra-left discussion. It was really like, you know, is this a safe thing to do? Like, oh, maybe we're safer off, just, you know, okay, fine. If we, we won't make money on it, but at least we won't have to deal with the controversy. We chose to deal with the controversy because we thought it was an important thing to do. I remember going out to their facility and meeting all the founders and spending hours and hours with people that I actually politically completely disagree with. But knowing that I am not entrusted with capital by the LPs to invest in people who believe in my political beliefs. Right? I have to invest in the best available technology to solve the most interesting and important problems. And I think, you know, this, this can quickly turn into a philosophical rant, but the point is that VCs who are investing in these sorts of areas have to make those decisions. Just like VCs who are investing in stem cell technologies and cutting edge biotechnology have to make important moral ethical decisions, you can't shy away from it because then you're not solving important problems that need to be solved.
Um, you know, if I, I could jump in on this from the company perspective as well. First off, thank you for thinking that I'm moral. That makes me feel really nice. Uh, take a moment so for far, the so for the warm fuzzies to set in. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we always viewed as being really important at Anduril <clears throat> is telling people what it is that they're doing. And I think this is where a lot of the controversy comes up in tech, where people feel blindsided by work with the Department of Defense. And a lot of times companies try to do this in the funniest ways. And some of you have probably seen this, where they're like, yes, we are building autonomous technology, but it's to deliver aid packets to downed soldiers in, 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 in like some variation of this. Or like we're, we're working on, you know, human aid operations in Central Africa and really like eventually it's very obvious their platform is going to be used to de deliver a kinetic payload. But they never tell their employees this and then when it comes out it's like really messy. So at Anduril, during our orientation we say, you're building weapons. We're just gonna say what it is. You're building weapons. You're gonna build weapons platforms. Some of those are going to have lethal impact. We believe this is important, and we're willing to stand up here and debate with you about the merits of the morality and the ethics of those decisions, and we, as leadership, are holding ourselves accountable to that standard, and we are not going to shy away from the responsibility and accountability that we have to hold uh, in that context. And the way that plays into autonomous weapons as well, it's, I'm glad you brought that up, is that we believe it is important to have humans in the loop on, uh, on lethal decisions, we also recognize that in the future, there will be non-human in the loop autonomous weapon systems. Maybe they're not lethal towards humans, but if you have a hypersonic missile coming towards you, uh, towards an aircraft carrier, even today, there are auto turrets that take out aerial threats to aircraft carriers without humans in the loop. That is a fully autonomous weapon system. We don't talk about that very publicly, and I think people like try to, you know, tiptoe around it, pretend that it doesn't happen. That happens today. There's already fully autonomous weapon systems. And in the future, it, the, the kill chain is not gonna get longer. The kill chain is gonna get shorter. We're gonna have to make decisions more rapidly. And we want people at our company to know we are going to stand up in front of you and be responsible for that decision. And we wanna have a conversation about it. We're not gonna pretend that it's not gonna happen. Uh, we are going to debate as a company the merits of doing these things. And, if we as a company decide that we don't believe this is ethical and the leaders are backing away from it, then we're not going to build that technology. But we're at least going to tell people up front what it is that we're doing. I was going to say thank you so much, Trey. Um, I know we're almost out of time, and I didn't know if anybody wanted to ask some questions, but I wanted to give you a chance to do that. Um, I think, uh, hold on one second. They've got another mic for you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Connie, first of all, thank you for moderating. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. My name is Ryan Micheletti. I'm one of the GPs at the Veteran Fund. We invest in military veterans and dual-use technologies. We're pre-seed and seed, and you know, ideally, we want to be a pipeline empowering the founders of this room to be able to build companies and technologies that have a positive impact in the United States. What can we do as early investors to support founders that are building these dual-use technologies? Um, well, uh, first off, thanks, uh, thanks for doing that. I think it's really important to have uh, a robust ecosystem here. You don't want to be the only investor in a certain space. You know, as I think about early stage companies, you know, there's three things that matter and in that order, team, market, and technology. So, you know, helping those early founders as they're putting their, their ideas together, like what's the right team? Technology, business, you know, startups are, are really hard. And it takes years of sustained effort uh, to, to defy the odds and, and make it successful. So are these, you know, is this team going to gel well and they're going to run through walls for six years? Like, that's number one. And then if they do run through those walls and it's successful, uh, you know, is it big enough that it matters? So, like, what's, what's the market? And then the technology, of course, important, but, you know, I always put that third. So I think as an early stage, helping shape that so that when they're ready for subsequent rounds of financing, those things are together. <laughs> I would just add a few things, and we can go on for an hour about this. But um, you know, the startups have a life of their own. You you have a north star, but you don't know whether you're going to get there or you're going to be a little bit to the left or the right of it, and what path you're going to take. And being prepared for that is is really important. And I think veterans, in my experience, uh, are more resilient to that. 
what they often don't know is that the counterparty that they're talking to is maybe not clued into their own psyche and not speaking the same language. So understanding when a VC says, you know, this idea is not big enough, what does that really mean? Like, you know, maybe this product is big enough, but the idea needs to be bigger. Like, Andural is not a one product company, even though if you looked at the seed round, there was one product, but it, they, they understood that and they projected what can that be? Um, and, and, and I think that's really important. The second is companies, just, just like companies, military doesn't buy technology, they buy solutions. And I think veterans can be a great help in understanding, you know, being the bridge between the two sides that you know, what is, what is the end use and, and how is it going to be utilized so that the product is actually uh, you know, service right? Like it, it, you know, the example that Trey was giving around dropping you know, um, aid in Central Africa, some of that aspects of that are just not gonna apply to DOD, right? So if you're going into DOD, understanding what is it that's going to be required so that you don't end up building a product that's wrong. I have invested and lost a lot of money building products that were either you know, overbuilt or they were underbuilt for the exact use case that the military had. And the third thing is that, you know, this is, you guys are trained in OODA loops and shorting the OODA loops, right? So orienting yourself, deciding, and then acting. Just do it, move fast, right? And, and people who I have seen succeed are people who don't take, you know, military's way of working as the only way that it works. They sort of try to find ways around it. It's, you know, I would be the last person to tell you which branch of military does that better, but clearly there are people out there who are not just marching in regiment. They're like out there, they dropped five people, and they're like, I will do whatever it takes to get an operation done. Like, be like that. A lot of our customers end up with SOCOM being an early customer. Why? Because they have a limited amount of budget available, and they can spend it to move fast. It's not huge. You can't build an entire company just servicing SOCOM, but you can definitely get started. So it's things like that that, you know, where understanding these customers to, understanding these founders to have their, you know, differentiated advantage over everybody else, because compared to them, a random Stanford student pitching me a business and they have no context, right? Like I'm having to find, frankly, somebody like Trey, having a conversation with them and hiring somebody there to do that veteran-founded companies automatically come with that. The very simple thing that I would ask is introduce companies to us before they're fundraising for the Series A. I don't want to meet a founder I've never met before where they're like, I have two weeks before I run out of money or I've got a term sheet on the table, I need it, you know, a hustle round to come together. Like, I just want to meet them when you think they're cool before they're raising an A. Great. Uh, got a question over here. Uh, question here. Brian Katz, uh, civilian job uh, in the Pentagon, uh, working for the USDI uh, here in a personal capacity, and uh, starting with DIU, actually, uh, to help with some of their IC engagement. My question is uh, for, the, for the department, I'm, again, personal capacity. Um, one of the new big initiatives is the Office of Strategic Capital, which theoretically stood up to solve the problem of how you steer U.S. private capital towards the critical technologies and other priorities for the department. And in some ways, it seeks to emulate, I think, probably the existing great model for that, which is Steve's organization with InQtel, with the one minor difference of not having any money of itself to invest. So I'm curious, from your perspective, and knowing that it's early and things can change, and I guess Steve will love your perspective, but the, the three gentlemen representing actual uh, dual-use VCs here. How, how can this new organization, Office of Strategic Capital, and I guess in more general, the department's efforts to, to deepen its outreach with, with venture capital and others, be most useful for venture capital uh, and the, fun, and the uh, companies that you back? Trey, do you want to go first for me? Because I know what you're going to say, and I'm going to have a slight nuance to it. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you go first? <laughs> I've been pub publicly disparaging of the Office of Strategic Capital. So um, th there's a good version of it, and there's a bad version of it. And I've, I've talked to Jason Rathje, who's great, and I think he's, like, his incentives are in the right place, and his, his heart is as well. Um, the, the good version of this is they have access to SBIC mechanisms that would allow them to provide capital to companies to build up things like manufacturing capacity, factories uh, with very low interest rates. This is great. Like, the, you know, 
uh, as the Undersecretary for Acquisitions has pointed out, half of this is innovation, half of it is like, can you actually build things rapidly enough to matter to the warfighter? We need that. It, is, it was super useful to Tesla to have that sort of government money to help them stand up their capacity. We should be doing the same thing in the defense space. I'm here for that. That's the good version. The bad version of this that gets bandied around is that there are industries of technology that are underrepresented in the capital stack that can't raise money from VCs and the government should step in to fix this. That is baloney. There is a nearly infinite amount of VC money sloshing around, a lot of it dumb. Um, and if you can't raise money, it's because you suck at raising money. It has nothing to do with oh, nobody wants to invest in this really important strategic technology. It's like, no, you're probably like an academic that like drones on for three hours every time you talk to an investor. Like, that is the problem. Um, so that, that, that's my critique, is if the government thinks that they're going to fill in the gap where no one else is willing to give them money, well, congratulations, you've now lost a bunch of taxpayer money. All right. <laughs> I knew what I was going to say. Awesome. <laughs> so... Uh, so I, I'll agree with that, right? There's no shortage of money for good companies, right? And you don't want the government to become the lender of last resort, right? Where I couldn't raise from anybody else, please help me government, right? And the government's not going to, you know, unless you have an organization like Incutel that's been doing it for 20 years, you know, uh, to, to sniff out the BS, because there's plenty of it um, out there. But I guess the, the approach that, or the, the view that I take is a little different, uh, and which I think uh, Jason and his team is doing well, is... You know, if you look at, so let's just look at defense budgets, right? Defense budgets uh, went from being about 45% of our outlays in the 60s, 62, to 10% last year, right, of the total federal budget. Entitlements, interests, and other spending is, is, is crowding it out. And as we look at conflict around the world, we're not going to buy our way out of the problem. So how do we get more efficient? And I think there are big pools of money in the government that are just going to sheer rent-seeking behavior. Right? And I think this SBIC program is one of those. And I, I forget the numbers. It's like two, three billion dollars a year that I, you know, is really not moving the needle for any of its stated objectives or national security. And so to repurpose that money and put it to some place that could be better, right? Give it to, uh, um, you know, help support funds, help support companies. You know, that's going to be a much better outcome. I would make the same argument for a lot of our SBIR, the small innovation, you know, research grant money. You know, what percentage of those go to production? It's low, we do the math. It's low single digit. It's almost a sign that if you win one of those contracts, the government's not going to buy its scale from you. Right? It's like a negative signal that you got one. So why don't we repurpose those money? So I approach it from an efficiency standpoint, and so I, I, I like that, that's the part I do like about the what Jason and OSC is doing. And I, and I so, so I'm publicly now going on about office of strategic capital. I'm public that SBIRs are a complete waste of money, and 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 frankly, when founders ask me that you know we you know should we talk about our SBIRs, I just take it out of your decks. It's like completely useless for for all the reasons that you just heard. I think there is a bigger fundamental problem, which is that the military, the big military, whatever it is, sees all the work that Silicon Valley does and all the startups do and companies do as sort of R&D. I don't think they see this as valid creators of products that they're going to actually buy and procure and give it to the warfighter. They see this, I don't know, some parts of it may see this as an entitlement program, job creation. We have, you know, labs. I was funded by Air Force Research Labs. I was working on some climate modeling stuff. Um, so a lot of the money and a lot of the discussions, and I've had similar conversations with Jason and his team, and is it seems to be going in the direction of we need to kind of do more R&D. There are fancy words used for that now. There was translational research and, you know, areas of sectors of national security and national importance. If you want to give money to r and I am all for it as a PhD. Sure, absolutely. Find the right mechanisms to do it. It's probably not people sitting inside the Defense Department. You want to give money to professors to do build the next generation of whatever? Sure. You know, we need more R&D money. We should do that. But don't call that money that's going towards funding startups and supporting innovation that can cre create products that the military will buy. That, I think, is a farce, and that needs to go away. And, and we need to get the military to buy the products. I mean, I think all four of us have said that's a like hundred times to you know, people all around the country. 
These companies have plenty of money, they're building products, you're not buying them. Stop creating new ones. Buy the products from these companies that are there. There are at least hundreds if not thousands of companies that are building products right now that DOD has no mechanism to purchase their products. Yeah. Hey, Brian, great to see you. Um, yeah, so for, I think like everybody on this uh, uh, panel here, I think we all have great respect for Jason and what he's doing. You know, and I think that uh, as Trey sort of alluded to, the full vision that Jason has for Office of Strategic Capital is not fully public yet. And there's a lot of different elements. And so it's an a la carte menu of building up a series of financial levers that can be pulled to try and further the DOD's interest here in technology. And I think some of them will be more effective than, than others. I, am, uh, I, I agree with sort of two of the fundamental points made by the others here. One, the extent OSC is emulating some of the things done by DOE, DOE and DFC in terms of providing uh, low cost capital to help fuel either manufacturing capacity or factories being built, or uh, I think there's opportunity in critical materials to help build mines and processing plants uh, uh, for that. That's really important to us. I think there's a lot of things like that that can be done that can mirror more effective, mirror effective uh, uh, successful programs in the past in other areas. I think DOD should be all over that, and I think Jason's going to drive a lot of uh, success there. Secondly, though, I also agree with uh, uh, some of the points made here, including also by uh, uh, Trey's old uh, uh, colleague, uh, Shaim uh, uh, Shankar, in a, a blog post the other week, where he said the government needs to be a good customer first, and that's more important than anything else they can do in this space. And I think that is what you're hearing loud and clear, for, I think, from everybody on, the, on this panel here. What uh, the best part of InQtel's aspects has been has been when we've been a customer, best part of DIU's. Uh, uh, success has been when they've been a customer or facilitated customers. And the extent the government can be a better customer to these great uh, 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 companies that are building great technologies, that's really what's going to drive uh, uh, success, success here for all of us. Um, one more question. Got a question over here, sorry. Uh, Trevor Mallow, I'm a former Indo-PACOM foreign area officer. I've got regional domain experience in Asia. I uh, used to be an entrepreneur in residence at SOSV's Indie Bio, right down the street, some known friends here, and then now at a late stage company that's dual use called Premise. We crowdsource insights in 140 countries. One of the debates we've been having uh, amongst friends that are dealing in dual use space is, hey, some of us that have you know, veteran operator experience, we kind of know the domain and the mission sets we're working on, we know the government's a terrible customer. We also know that we need lobbying in order to get through some of those early valleys. We're debating. This is a question we want you to help us settle. If the next company we work on uh, is defense, when's the VC money gonna run out? We're all waiting for an exit successful. We hope it's gonna be Andrew next, but beyond that, uh, we're all kind of needing the next cheer in order for those of us that are early stage to get to it. I love, I love the structure of the question. <laughs> and our VC is going to realize that they're throwing good money after bad to be resolved next season. I, I thought the question was, Trey, when's Anderil's IPO? <laughs> <laughs> Anderil is not near-term IPOing, um, but uh, the business is growing really well, and that is something that VCs are seeing. Um, you know, we actually beat projections by $100 million last year, so like, it is possible. And I, I think people are seeing that it is possible, you know, that we have um, a lot of like, you know, very well-known tier one venture funds around our board table, uh, Lux, Andreessen, General Catalyst, um, uh, Valor Equity Partners, which is Antonio Gracias, who's on the board of SpaceX and Tesla, um, and, and others. And I think, th I think they're seeing like these kind of unlocks that we're having um, that proves that it's possible. You can build the business. Uh, the question is, uh, and I, I say this in like the most serious way possible, the question is really about paranoia. Um, and you know, my defense fellow at Founders Fund uh, is sitting here in the audience. Um, you guys should go talk to him, he's the best. Um, and he hears me say this all the time in meetings. Like, when I go into a meeting with a, a founder that wants to sell to the DOD and he, they're really confident about their ability to do it, I'm like, definite pass. Like, I, I want you to like, just be filled with raging paranoia. Um, and that's usually like the best sign when somebody is like, Lockheed is going to steal this business from me. I'm like, you're goddamn right Lockheed's going to steal this business from you. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and I think that's like, that's the key. So is it, is it possible that VC money is going to run out? Yeah, it's possible. Uh, are there proof points that they're making progress? Yeah, there are. Just be super paranoid. 
the more paranoid you are, the higher the likelihood for success. I think there's also too much hype that gets created in these companies. Focus less on that. Like it's not about how much money you can raise and you know who you can raise from and so on. Focus on what does it take to build a company. I mean, at the end of the day, even Andrel is one company in our portfolio, right? So if we lose all our money in Andrel, we've still lost some small percentage of all the AUM that we've got. But for those who are working on the company, all the Andrel employees, they're putting you know, five, 10, maybe much longer. If you're at SpaceX, you've been around for a long time and you haven't seen an IPO yet. So, you, but you're really focused on building the solutions, building the products and getting them out. That intensity is something very different. You know, we have a company called Applied Intuition in our portfolio. I won't give you their numbers, but they've been profitable for three years and massive revenues. Um, and, and this is a company, if you talk to them, it's so intense. Like, they don't give a shit. They've got Mark Andreessen on their board. They've got, you know, Hemant Taneja on their board. They've got, you know, all the same investors, a lot of the similar investors. Um, but, you know, you walk into their offices and everybody has to take their shoes off and wear slippers. And you're like, wait, that's a weird thing. Like, why do we need... Because the intensity of the CEO is, I want everybody to feel that they're coming to almost like a house of worship. You, you spend more time here than anything else. This is your family. This is your putting, you know, you're not with your kids. He's like, I am not with my kids because I'm working here till 10, 11 every night. This is fucking important. This has to work, right? That intensity is often missing because a lot of people get caught up in, you know, I'm V tall and I'm, you know, I have this SBIR from here and I've, don't get caught up in any of this stuff. Execute, execute, execute. And I think VCs are starting to, you know, certainly there's those on the stage and there are a few others who are starting to see through that, as Trey said, you know, it's not about confidence. It's we know that, you know, it's a very long haul. It takes a long time, but companies can actually win and, and return capital. Right now, there are three areas that every VC is looking at and no VC is saying no to. It's defense, it's ESG slash climate tech, and it's AI. Right? Everything else is getting, eh, I don't know, maybe. But these three areas, if you come in, I'm pretty sure that you will find reception in Silicon Valley right now. Palmer almost cut his toe off with a plasma torch uh, in our warehouse. So wh wear shoes to work, please. <laughs> you can alter from, from, from my, my perspective. <laughs> it's intense. <laughs> Super intense. Um, yeah, look, I don't think VCs are going away. I mean, uh, can I have a firm sort of focus on this? And so I'm, I'm, I'm all in, <laughs> we're not going anywhere. Um, but no, I think there is a, there is a, is a sea change. I think the, the geopolitical climate uh, is, is going to continue to force this view of, of commercial technology and, and this intersection is gonna get closer, like it just has to, like democracy is worth defending and, and this is gonna be critical to that. So I don't think it's gonna dry out um, and you know, again, I, I think one point that these guys all made too, which is, you know, fundraising is not the goal. That's just a step, right? You got to delight customers. You delight them, solve their problem in a way that no one else can. Like a great business will be get built. Maybe it takes a little bit longer, but you got to play the, the the long game. And and uh, so I'm I'm quite bullish on the on this whole area. Great, thank you all so much. I'm sorry, we've got to wrap this up. <laughs> but um, it was really a treat to sit down with each of you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tim, for hosting all of us. And Great. Yeah. Before, uh, uh, stay put, please. Um, we're going to take a group photo, uh, but also want to say one thing, which I've been saying multiple times the past few days, which is the importance of civilians. I know it sounds so obvious. It's like, why is this dude saying the importance of civilians? Uh, this dual-use panel about military technology, four out of the five panelists are non-veterans, right? Four of the five speakers, including the moderator, are non-veterans. The second I asked them, hey, can you join us at the Military Veteran VC Conference? They said, yes, right? And so it's harder to pull in actually big name veteran, veteran VCs to this conference than it is civilians. So uh, love your tribe, but expand your tribe. Thank you all so much. Hold on, thank you so much.